Well, good morning, Forefront. Good morning. Uh, I'm Reverend Josh Lee, one of the co-pastors of Community and Teaching. And uh, I forgive me, there are no slides this morning. Uh, Pastor Vinita got sick, and so I arrived last night back from Austin on my honeymoon and wrote this sermon. So let's... <laughs> you might want to wait until the end to clap about that. Uh, we'll see how this goes. So may, may the Lord bless, or the Spirit bless, the preparing, the preaching, and the receiving of this word. Amen? Amen. So we're in the second week of our series on prayer, um, and one of the questions I want to start this week asking you is this, what are the things that keep you from praying? Um, and I know that most of us, that is a question we probably could answer. Uh, why? Because many of us who've gone on the deconstructive journey, often when we sort of deconstruct, and even after we reconstruct our beliefs, often our theologies just often don't really fit with how we were taught about prayer. And it's a real struggle, and it's a real challenge, and it sometimes can feel irreconcilable. And so I think that's why we decided to talk about this topic of prayer, because uh, it's, it's, it's such a, a bedrock element of our faith, yet oftentimes uh, in progressive spaces, it's very rarely talked about and very little practiced. And so as a church, we're trying to live into this more. But I also, I also think that that, that question is important because um, some of us avoid prayer because we don't want to do it wrong, so we just don't do it at all. Or we were taught that there was just like one way to pray. And I don't know about you, but I remember for myself when I, the, I grew up in the Pentecostal Charismatic Church, and so we would often pray all at once. Like, like the music would be playing and everybody's like just praying out loud. Some people in tongues, if you don't know what that is, talk to me later. Some people all praying in the same language. Uh, and all just sort of crying out and praying at, and praying with deep agony in from our hearts. And sometimes also there was the popcorn prayers. You know, you'd stand in a circle and everybody would pray. It took forever, forever. And then there was the gossip prayers that was like, well, I heard that sister so-and-so did this or that. We need to be praying for her, you know. And you're like, oh, Lord, have mercy. You always have the, you always have the tea to pray for people to spill up here. You know, you have those. And then I remember when I went into the Methodist church, they started praying in a way that I'm like, oh, I kind of like this. They prayed in two different ways uh, in the sort of, and this is very simple. This is very common in the mainline Christian traditions. Somebody would, in, in church would say, uh, I need a job. And everyone would say, Lord, in your mercy. And the congregation would respond, hear our prayers. And, or somebody would say, oh, I, I, I'm pregnant. And we're just so excited about this. And the pastor would say, Lord, in our gratitude. And everybody would say, hear our prayers. Okay. And I'm like, this goes a lot faster. I'm like, this is nice. But yet there's this sort of moment of rejoicing and excitement. Um, and, and it doesn't have anybody, one person monopolizing a bunch of time or, or gossiping and controlling in that way. I kind of like that. Uh, and, then, and then also in the, in the mainline Christian traditions, which again, as we've talked about we, weeks prior, mainline is often like Episcopalians and Lutherans and Methodists and people who are like historic Christian denominations that have been around for hundreds of years since the break off from the Catholic Church. And in these traditions, sometimes they also have what's often viewed as contemplative prayers, okay? And so sometimes this is chanting, sometimes this is sitting in silence, sometimes um, this looks like praying the same few words over and over again, uh, contemplative practices. And now, when I first got introduced to these practices, I was like, well, this is like the devil. <laughs> like, yoga? What? You know, I, I'm like, we, we were told we we're not allowed to do this in the church. Yoga was of Satan. And they're like, well, this is Christian yoga. I'm like, what? What is Christian yoga? You know, I was so confused. Um, but I, I decided that, that I, just, just because I was taught something didn't mean I should close myself off to it. Because I, I got to the point in my life where I even ended up in a space that was doing this because I was open to so many things. And so, well, let's just try it, okay? And so I did. And honestly, it, it, was, it, it wasn't my thing, okay? Sitting in silence, not really my thing. Uh, and and I've, I've come to learn and understand that. For me, though, I learned that my practice is music. That is my prayer practice. Like, I can just, there's, I'll wake up most mornings, like I am this, like, girl in a dress, just dancing through a field, just with a certain song in my spirit. Just kind of every morning, that's kind of how I start my day. And sometimes it's secular, but most of the times it's Christian. And, and that's, I know my prayer through the day. And sometimes I'll check in with myself. Why is that song on my heart? Why are the words to that song something that's repeating in me? And if I'm attuned to it, if I sit in the silence enough to actually explore it, I realize that that's a form of prayer, that my soul is speaking to me, and my soul is communing with God. Uh, and so prayer can take so many different forms. It can look so many different ways. 
And, and more than that, talking about the idea of prayer, doing it wrong or not, um, some of us are extroverted and some of us are introverted. So some of us are like, the idea of like praying out loud, we're like, what? You know, we don't even verbally process with our friends or people in our lives, let alone process with God in that way. And so we've been taught that the internal thoughts isn't a prayer. That has to be spoken out loud. <clears throat> Long lies, not true. Okay, sorry. That's just not it. Some people, whether, some people pray internally, they never speak a word, and some people pray externally. Some people are really good in that circle when they're just like praying out loud, and you're like, wow, I don't even want to pray now because how am I going to top that? Right? And so you just don't. And I want to tell you this today. I want to just give you this permission. There is no proper way to pray. There is no standard way that everyone is supposed to pray. Prayer is so much more complex and nuanced. More than that, prayer is a smorgasbord of ways to connect with God. There is a smorgasbord of ways, okay? This is not just one thing on the menu. There are so many ways, depending on your personal makeup, of your spirituality, of how you will choose to connect with God. And I don't speak this morning as an expert on prayer. I promise you this. I am simply a pilgrim on the journey trying to figure it out. And so there probably will be things that I say today that maybe I don't even believe in like a year because I'm still wrestling and trying to figure this out because prayer is such an incredibly bizarre mystery that both does something on our, internally within us and as well as changes the atmosphere and can change our path and our connections with others and can change our emotional state and our mental state. It's, it's this mind-boggling thing. A Gallup poll revealed that Americans will, pay, will pray this week more than they will exercise, drive a car, have sex, or go to work. It's crazy to think that that many people are praying. Now, again, when, when, when Gallup poll says prayer, prayer, that was very vague. So many people understand prayer to be many different things and many different expressions. But to think that that many people are wrestling with this. Philip Yancey wrote a fantastic book on prayer. This is the book on prayer that allowed me to pray again. When I deconstructed my faith and was very frustrated with God and couldn't quite put it all back together, I read this book on prayer and I just sort of like fit. I went like, ah. Oh. This, this makes sense. I get this. Why, why have I not read this book in all these years? And so Philip Yancey's book on prayer, I highly encourage you if you're trying to just figure out your, your sort of recalibration of prayer. It's really beautiful. And he says this in the book. He says, when I listened to public prayers in evangelical churches, I heard people telling God what to do, combined with thinly veiled hints on how God should behave or how others should behave. When I listened to prayers in more liberal churches, I heard calls to action, as if prayer was something to just get past so the real work of the kingdom can get done. I think this is true, right? A lot of times in maybe the more conservative, fundamentalist evangelical spaces, it's like, how can we move God or convince God to do what we want to do, right? And so we've got we to get more people praying. That just feels really problematic. You think God is sitting up there going, well, if you can just get six more people on that prayer chain, then, I'm then I'll just take care of this situation right here. Oh, you only got five? Sorry, you didn't make, meet, meet your quota. You don't get your bonus today. No, God, God that's not, I, I cannot imagine, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but, but that I cannot imagine, that I cannot fathom, that I cannot put together, that God is somehow up there in that way trying to reach these quotas. Or that God needs us to convince God to do something, or that we have the answer, or we know the right way. And so, like, if we can just sort of pitch it the right way to God, God will be like, all right, all right, all right. Or like maybe God didn't hear it, but then you go to the Holy Spirit, you know, the, you're kind of playing your parents against each other. Couldn't get God to do it, but maybe you can get the Holy Spirit to do it, right? And so there's this weird element. Uh, sometimes we have a relationship with her, but then in the liberal churches, in the more progressive churches, there is often, as I started the sermon, a dismissal of it. Well, the real work is just, just do it. We don't need your thoughts and prayers. We need your action. And what if, what if it's ne neither extreme? What if it's a nice place in the middle? What if it's all of it? What if it's not neither or, but it's and? Prayer is not this sort of unique thing, though, just to Christianity. I think it's important to think that prayer is something that, is, that, it, that transcends all cultures. Uh, remote tribes and large empires like the Roman Empire, um, they sacrificed animals. They sacrificed, they sacrificed uh, food and grain in order to move the gods so that they could have good health or they could have food or they could have rain for their crops, or they could have children, or victory in battle. The Aztecs, they even sacrificed humans for these purposes. Modern Muslims, they pray five times a day, and millions in AA and, and, and recovery programs, they pray or petition to a higher power for strength because they can't find the strength within themselves, but only outside of themselves in order to overcome. Even 
atheist in 1950 communism and the rule of Russia under Stalin. This was, this, this was, the, this was a, a high-prized value quote from that time. It said, if you meet difficulties in your work, suddenly doubt your abilities, are tired or seeking direction, just think of Stalin and you will find the confidence you need. <laughs> Even if you're not praying to a physical de deity or God that you can't see, you're probably putting your faith in something. Whether it's Stalin, whether it's empire, whether it's a person, whether it's your parents, whatever it may be, whether it's the government, whether it's the universe, and whatever that means to you, you're probably putting your faith into something. When Austin and I moved here uh, two, two years ago this week, uh, we really realized something that was kind of interesting about ourselves was it rained the whole time we were coming, like all 16 hours in the U-Haul, constant down, downpouring rain. And Austin turned to me, my husband is agnostic, and he said, do you think this is a sign? I said, you're agnostic. What are you talking about? A sign. He said, do you think this is a sign we made the wrong choice? And I'm like, no, I don't believe in that garbage like that. No, they, this is just, it's just raining. And, and, and we're just following the clouds, right? But, but I'm like, it's, it's mind-boggling because here he is, someone who's agnostic, who, who's, who's not quite sure what he thinks or believes all about this, but yet he's ascribed to some type of cultural ideals and ideas and beliefs around signs and things of this that maybe should be guiding our paths. Fascinating how we all, it's sort of all sort of in us. What I think is even more fascinating is how in Western American culture, we don't really have a big reason to pray often. What do I mean by that? Prayer throughout history is something that people ran to in desperation because they felt small and tiny and powerless. Because they needed comfort and there was something outside of themselves that they needed to bring them comfort but in today's society, we often have things like suicide hotlines and therapists and counselors and support groups. We have the Red Cross Relief. We have food banks and, and stabling housing organizations and science and technology so that farmers don't have to just simply pray for the rain to come, but instead modern technology to ensure that the crops are watered. And we have, when a child is ill, a parent no longer has to pray and just trust that maybe the gods will heal their child, but instead they can actually take them to the doctor and give them modern medicine. Our relationship with prayer has changed dramatically, particularly for those who are wealthy and privileged and those who are not uh, in third world countries. It makes no sense to pray, give this day our daily bread when the pantry is full, one author says. For nothing is truly asking us to pray that if our pantry is full. So what's the purpose of prayer? Can we change God's mind or convince God to do something? Is prayer the tool that God uses perhaps to change our mind and our heart? Is prayer to convince God or to convince ourselves to accept the will of God? Is prayer to change God's mind to move God to action or to move us to action about the things that we're seeing in the world? Oftentimes when I hear people pray for something, I'll ask myself, okay, now is that something that I could do? Like, they just lifted up a prayer request. You know, they're going to surgery or they feel really isolated alone or like their mental health's really bad. Sure, let me pray for that. I'll pray for that. that. That's one question. And then my next question right after that is, and is there anything I can do to be an answer to that prayer? And I don't think we often make that next step in the journey. Oh yeah, you know what? I could, I could connect them with some mental health counselors. Oh, well, you know what? Actually, yes, I, I do think the church could probably support them with a little bit of financial assistance. Oh, you know what? Yes, that person's looking for a job. I, actually, I think I know some people in the church that are in that same field of work. Let me connect you with them. Maybe, maybe there are some openings there. Prayer is just as much about speaking to God as it is allowing God to speak back to us about how we may be the answer to the prayer. What if, what if prayer inten it, 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 prayer's intent is is to change our hearts and our minds to align with God's will and deepest desires for our, our lives? What if it is to bring God's will on earth, not our will to earth? What if prayer was the tool God uses to align our hearts to care for and see the world just as much as God does? I can remember when my grandfather uh, was, was on his deathbed, and my grandmother, strong Pentecostal charismatic woman, uh, she's like, just doesn't want him to pass. She just wants more time with him. And she finds this prayer in scripture called the, the prayer of Hezekiah, where a prayer is made and God gives life for, I think it was like 14 or 15 more years. I, I honestly can't remember the exact number and I don't think I wrote it down. 
15 more years that I have written down here, but I don't know if that's true. And so my grandma's like, Hezekiah prayed for more time on this earth, and so I'm going to pray the prayer of Hezekiah for your grandfather so that I can have him longer. And so she did, and he came through it, and he lived a little bit longer, just about to that mark of that time. And over those years, my grandmother waited on him hand and foot. Because all while he survived, he was pretty much bound to his lazy boy. And she would bathe him and cook food for him and watch television with him and, and play her violin and the piano and sing songs to him. She just basked in every moment. She didn't care what physical state he was in. She was just glad she had him. And then when he left, she was convinced that God would come and take her soon because her call on the earth was over in her opinion. The patriarchy did a big number on my grandmother where she thought her only purpose was to raise children and to take care of my grandfather. And once the children were raised and my grandfather was gone, she had no purpose. When you build your life on that, when you, on people like that, it's, it's one of the greatest uh, disservices that we have in our culture for women through patriarchy. And it, it totally destroyed her. And so she was, in my opinion, spiritually suicidal because all she could think was, I just want to go to heaven. I just want to die now. She lost her purpose in life. And year after year would pass, she'd go, this is the year God told me she, he's going to take me. He's going to take me. And my grandma has lived many, many years, almost another 15 now after that. She's 84 this year. And my grandmother's view of prayer has changed because God hasn't taken her yet. And God didn't answer her the way he thought that she was going to answer her. And I've seen my grandma's beliefs and the way she prays and the way she thinks change so dramatically from back then. And I never, never had to say anything to my grandma like, Grandma, that's crazy theology. What are you talking about? That's not how that is. That, that's just lining you up for disappointment. That wasn't for me to call her out on. This is her journey. If that's what brought her comfort, let it bring her comfort. I don't need her to think a certain thing about her prayer life. Now, if she wants to put that on me, that's another story. <laughs> but I want us to think about the reality is, is that we all are on our own journey in our own relationship in negotiation and conversation and prayer. Let me look at this. Who, who, do we, who do I look at when I want to figure out how to pray? Who do I look at when I want to figure out how to love or live in the world? Good old Jesus. So let's just look at how he prayed, okay? Because if, if we're going to figure out how, how, how to pray, I think even God in flesh uh, is a great example of how to pray in the world. So there's a couple different examples. Jesus prayed uh, several different instances we have throughout Scripture where it talks about Jesus prayed. It says Jesus prayed in the synagogue, the church, okay? Jesus prays before and sometimes after he heals folks. Jesus often prays alone. It says he, he, very often he slips off on his own, often by himself, away from the disciples. It says that Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is when he was saying, you know, basically like, God, please, I do not, I do not want to go to the cross. This is going to be painful. This is going to be awful. Is there any other way? Is there any other possible plan? Scriptures tell us that Jesus asked three times while in the garden, praying, asking God to, to just make it any other way than the cross. It says he literally was sweating blood. Talk about the agony, the pain. Is, it, is, that, is that literally possible? I don't know. Maybe it was a metaphorical image in Scripture. But what I, what I do know with this is Jesus asked three times, and finally on the third time in Scripture when Jesus is praying, the third time when he realizes that it is not going to be his will done, but God's will done. He finally says, okay, then help me accept this and this, give me the strength to go to the cross. This is the same thing that Paul does. Paul has what we, what we call the thorn in the flesh, Paul calls it. And he asks three times in scripture, God, take this thorn in the flesh. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh is because I think that we're supposed to allow the thorn to be any, the, anything in our lives that we don't want in our lives that we'd like God to change. Okay, we don't know what Paul's thorn was. It was a thorn meaning it was irritating, it was annoying, he wanted to get rid of it. You know, like a thorn in your finger, you just want it out, right? And Paul, Paul asks God three times, take this from me, take this from me, take this from me. On the third time, Paul finally says, fine, if you're not going to take it from me, give me the strength that in my weakness you may be strong. Give me the strength to bear up under it then. This is often the journey of prayer. The journey of prayer always begins with, God, just heal me. God, just make my marriage better. God, straighten my kid out. God, open my parents' eyes to accept my sexuality. God, give me a job that I actually enjoy. God, give me a job. God, help me pay my rent, whatever it may be. God, help me find community in this city. It always begins with just asking God, right? And, and honestly, I'm going to tell you this right now. It's okay to just ask God. 
It's okay to, even if you don't even believe, I don't believe that if I ask God for a specific thing, he's going to give it to me or that he needs me to ask or she needs me to ask in order to give it to me. What I, way I look at it is the way I look at it with my husband. I've said this before. There are times when my husband comes to me, he does not want me to fix a situation. He just wants me to listen. He just wants me to hear him. And there are times that I can't fix a situation. All I can do is listen. But even in the times when I can fix it, he's not interested in being fixed right now or, or, or going through all the solutions or possibilities. He just wants me to sit with him in his pain, sit with him in his sorrow, to hear it, to make space for it, to acknowledge it, and then to journey with him to wherever we're going to go, wherever that pain's going to lead. That's how I view my relationship with God. Let me tell you what, when I'm sick, even if I don't believe that I can convince God to do anything, I still say, oh, God, maybe better. <laughs> oh, take this away. Please let me be better by Sunday. You know, I, I, I do that, right? And even though I don't believe that because it's part of the journey, I, I just consider that a form of lamenting. God just hearing my pain, my sorrow. And then after I've done that enough times, I finally do what Jesus and Paul did. I kind of go, okay, God, help me just to bear up under this. Help me just to get through this until we come out on the other side. Give me the strength, give me the people, give me the community to come out of this. This is the journey of prayer. And that journey of wrestling with God and lamenting with God and, and expressing the pain and the hurt as Jesus did in the garden, as Paul did with this thorn, as I do when I go through certain challenges, at the end of it, that is the journey of faith. That is the journey that, that draws you both closer to God, closer to the community around you, and closer to change within yourself. Because it takes you on that journey. The biggest journey for me that I took on with that was absolutely, fundamentally, 100% my sexuality. Praying and praying for so many years for God to change my sexuality, God not changing my sexuality, me getting ticked off, me feeling like God wasn't listening, ignoring me, didn't care, I didn't have enough faith, you name it. And then on the other end of it, God finally going, I'm not changing you because there's nothing to change. And me going, oh, wow, it's been a long couple of years for me to hear that. But my heart wasn't ready to hear that. It took me years to pray and to wrestle until I could finally hear, no, 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 this thing that you're wanting isn't actually, isn't actually what I want and have for you. But that journey formed me. That journey made me. That journey drew me closer to God, closer to myself, and closer to community. And some of that, when I say closer to community, community means it drove me away from certain people and towards other people. It was all part of the journey. The journey of faith, the way that you pray in one season of your life may not be the way that you'll pray in all the seasons of your life forever. That's true in our relationships, isn't it? Whether as a parent or a grandparent uh, or however that may look, as a parent, the way you relate to your child as they're growing up is different when they're a toddler, when they're a teenager, when they're in elementary school, when they go off to college, when they become adults, when they have kids, it's always going to change. It's always going to evolve because your relationship is changing. Your relationship is evolving. It's moving. The same is true with God. And so the journey that we're on, the journey of prayer, I think when, when Paul says pray without ceasing, he's saying life is the prayer. The journey is the prayer. The internal wrestling, the external wrestling with God, with self, and with others till so you get to the place where you go, okay, God, I get it now. And when you get that, there'll be something else you won't get. <laughs> and it's just this constant cycle. I end with this thought here, a quote from Loder. He says, I have so many ways to pray, but you have so many ways to answer. You see, church, the point is that we engage prayer at all and God will reveal God's self in whatever we pray, in whatever season, in whatever way. No matter what your beliefs about prayer are, what we can unite around, I think, is this. That there are a plethora of ways to connect with God. And that no one can tell you how, and no one can tell you what to pray. All they can tell you is just pray. And sometimes that's with words, and sometimes that's not. Sometimes that's in silence. And sometimes that's through song. Sometimes that's through being angry with God and giving God the silent treatment. And sometimes it's just laughing with a belly laugh because you're so grateful you got to the end of a long journey. But prayer, prayer is the journey. The journey is prayer. As we come to the communion table today, I invite the worship team. We're going to sing a song called New Wine. 
And I, and I want to invite you to do something this morning. Uh, Austin and I don't really drink much, and we were just over Italy for, for two weeks, and, and there's wine galore. It's like water there, and it's so cheap. But we don't drink, and so we didn't drink a sip of wine. Uh, they gave us, they gave us, um, I don't drink not because of any moral convictions, just because it gives, gives me a headache. And, <laughs> and, 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 and my mouth gets a little loose when I drink too much. Uh, <laughs> you interpret that however you want. Um, and so this, this reality was, was that we were, we were there all week drinking water and everyone's drinking wine. And, and, and it really wasn't until the last few days that we realized that like, the wine is the same cost of water that they also charge you for. And we're like, this is mind-boggling, you know? What is this? What is going on? And, and, I, and, the, and, I, and I remember it began to think about, like, for them, access to wine is like how we have access to cornfields in the Midwest, okay? It's just, and, and, and Americans go over and they just tour the, the vineyards or the wine vineyards. This is so wonderful, and here's my glass. Ah, I'm such a lush. And that will be the equivalent to them coming over in, 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 into, into the Midwest and just walking through cornfields like, Dang, this is great. I love this. You know, and it's, 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 very, it's very equivalent to that. What, I, what I'm telling you this is the song that we're going to sing is New Wine. And, and feel free, band, worship team, feel free to come on up. What, what, I, what I'm telling you this is... is there's this tradition within, within Scripture and being in Rome, which is where a lot of our Scriptures were written, as well as in the Middle East, that you take wine, you prepare it, and you put it into a new wineskin. And you let it ferment, and you let it prepare, but then also, eventually that wineskin can rot, it can turn bad, and so also you, put that wine, you, put, you can transfer that wine into a new wineskin, and that will help it settle even more. And there's this sort of fermenting and, proce- and, and long process that goes through with making wine what it is. What I want to say to you this morning is that there has been a lot of things about prayer that have been given to you. And some of it is nourishing. And some of it quenches the thirst. And some of it doesn't. And it's okay to take some of the good and put it into a new wineskin bottle and to go on and use that. And it's okay to leave some of the other stuff behind. Another way to say is chew on the meat and spit out the bones. And so as you are working through your reconstruction process or deconstruction process, I invite you, put on new wineskin. Embrace prayer in a new way. Try out a form of prayer that you haven't tried out before. You're like, I don't know how to do that. I have a little cutout that you can get on your way out today with little, like some different prayer practices that you could embrace that could just help you, invite you to try out maybe different ways to pray that you haven't prayed before. I invite you, try on the new wineskin. Try on a new form of prayer. See that it may nourish you. See that it may uh, give you new life in a new way. Uh, as you